The Dean of Market Valuation, Ashwath Damodran, needs no introduction whatsoever. He is considered to be the final authority when it comes to pricing and valuation model. And he joins us with uh, his take on where the world is headed versus where the world could head. Uh, Professor Damodran, an absolute delight and a pleasure to have you back on ET now. Thank you for joining us. Now, before I get into specifics of valuations and what the world is pricing in, uh, characterize the current market environment for us. The script of how global markets have moved this year has been largely fueled because of liquidity. When we started the year, nobody liked the market. Then by mid of Feb, few started liking the market. Now everybody likes the market. So what's going on? I describe the market as a pricing game. It's not about value, it's about pricing. And people ask what the difference is. I tell them that pricing is driven by mood and momentum and that mood and momentum can shift on a dot. I mean, you're absolutely right. On December 31st, if you talk to experts around the world, and I'm sure you had a few on ET or on CNBC or anywhere else you watch them, they were convinced the world was coming to an end, that after the last quarter of last year, we were headed for a collapse. And I've learned never to take experts at their word for a simple reason. They're trying to read the tea leaves on what the mood and momentum is. And the mood and momentum shifted as it always does. And just and again, it can shift in the other direction as well. So I recognize that this is just a passing phase, that this too shall pass. Okay. Now before I get into India specific questions, let's take the conversation back, a chat which we had about a year ago, and you said that US tech companies had become like old manufacturing companies and they are unlikely to see their prime time once again. But guess what's happened? Suddenly the crown of world's most valuable company has been dethroned and Microsoft, yes sir, Microsoft, a company which was born in 1970s has become the world's most valuable company. So what is going on? Why a old uh, why old U.S. tech company is now the most commanding company, the most valuable company in the world? I think this is a race where you're going to see one, one company win, then another company win. These companies are, are older companies. I mean, let's start with that recognition. But they're better than the old manufacturing companies for a simple re reason. They're cash machines. I mean, let's face Windows and Office still generate the cash flows that Microsoft uses on everything else. Apple gets most of its money from its smartphone. Google still gets that box. The search engine is what drives it. So what these companies do is they've taken their cash machine and they're trying other things. Microsoft tried a bunch of things before they found the cloud. Apple tried a bunch of things before the smartphone caught on. So I think they're like manufacturing companies in terms of age, but they're cash machines in terms of how much cash flow they're throwing off. So these companies are not going anywhere fast. So in a sense, when you invest in these companies, you've got to invest for the right reasons. You're not investing in Microsoft because it's a high growth company. Even in spite of its really good last five years, it is not going to be a high growth company, but it's going to continue to be a cash machine. And you've got to give Satya Nadella the credit for having brought it back from the brink because it looked for a while that it was an office and windows company that was headed for decline. And I think by finding that second life in the cloud, they've been able to reduce themselves. Okay. Uh Professor, also if I look at the current environment and you know till the time uh, we got the Trump from Donald Trump, the world in a sense had reconciled to the fact that the trade war fear is behind us. Now when we spoke about the trade war fear for the first time in 2017 and early 2018, your view was that we could be staring at a new normal in the world. So do you think we are there yet? And there would be, uh, you know, a pushback, which certainly will come from Americans now, and Chinese would be on the receiving end. I think there is a recalibration in global trade. I think for a while, the the perception was anything that increases increases global trade is good, but the consequences of that were were pretty were pretty were, were not good for a lot of people in developed markets. Let's face it. Both Brexit and the election of Donald Trump reflected a reality, which is globalization was great for the cities. It was terrible for the rest of the country. And this was true in the US, it's true in the UK, it's true in Europe, it's true in India. Globalization, the experts and the financial markets have always loved because it makes them much more prosperous. But it's had real costs for the rest of the economy. So what you're seeing, I think, is a recalibration where People are saying, okay, trade is good, but there, are good, there have to be some rules that people follow. And I'll be quite honest, the Chinese have never followed rules when it comes to global trade. So 
Personally, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a Donald Trump supporter per se, but I think what he's doing with the Chinese was long overdue because the Chinese essentially took the trade rules, pushed them to the limit, broke them, and knew that people cared so much about global trade that there'd be no pushback. So now that there's some pushback, I think you're getting a reality adjustment here, which is that global trade can't be unrestrained, where some people break the rules and essentially get away with it, and some people keep to the rules. So I think that this is perhaps something that is needed in the long-term shift towards a global, a, a global market, is a sense that rules matter for everybody. Okay, uh, Professor, let's just talk about uh, the, the entire market cycle. Now, from Ray Dalio to Harvard Marx, everyone seems to be making a case that uh, the U.S. bull market is running on steroids. It is enjoying a sugar coat, a sugar rush, so to speak. Also, this is the longest bull market we've seen after Second World War. So, what is your sense on the longevity and the lifeline of this bull market? Do you think we are now nearing the end or this bull market still has some more life left? I mean, let's start with the, with the one fact that we know it's been a long bull market. Everything else is supposition. Remember what I said about expert up front. I would say that about everybody, even very smart people, even Warren, I take everybody with a grain of salt. That includes a Warren Buffett, a Ray Dalio. Doesn't mean that what they're saying doesn't make sense. I think it's just as a market ages, you're going to get worried and you're going to get the and you're going to pe get people wagging their finger saying, oh, there's going to be a correction. So let's start with the second reality. There will be a correction as there's in any market, bull market or not. And when that correction happens, you're going to see people wagging their fingers. Say, I told you so. I've learned to ignore these people because in a sense, if you worry about what's happened already and you constantly worry about corrections, I've discovered it does more damage to your investments and your portfolio than letting it ride. I'm, I'm not a good market timer. I know there's going to be a correction, but I have no idea when it's going to happen. So you know what I need to do? I need to go out and pick good companies. I can't worry about where the market is and when the next correction is coming because I find it undercuts my investing. I've got to focus on what I, what brought, what I brought to the table. And I'm not a market timer. So as I listen to these people, I agree with them. It's an aging bull market. There will be a correction. Are there people there who've lost all sense of risk? Absolutely. There's nothing I can do about them. It's almost a karmic view, which is, hey, what will be, will be. There's nothing I can do about that correction when it comes. And to the degree that I worry about things I don't control, it's going to hurt me as an investor. Great answer. You know, you can only control uh, what you buy and at what price you buy. Market cycles have to be independently viewed if you're a genuine long-term investor. So, Professor, let's talk about a concern which at least back home our Indian audience has. And the concern what our Indian audience and Indian investors have that India has got some fantastic companies uh, in the consumer space, in the banking space, in the consumer discretionary space, which are fantastically well-run and well-managed businesses. But they are not available cheap. P multiples are anywhere between 40 times or 70 times so what does one do if you think long term these companies will grow but if you buy them right now you're not buying them at attractive valuations it is like saying that you're buying silver at the price of gold what should investors do I mean let's start with the with the one fact that we know it's been a long bull market everything else is supposition Remember what I said about expert up front. I would say that about everybody, even very smart people, even Warren, I take everybody with a grain of salt. That includes a Warren Buffett, a Ray Dalio. Doesn't mean that what they're saying doesn't make sense. I think it's just as a market ages, you're going to get worried and you're going to get the, and you're going to get people wagging their fingers saying, oh, there's going to be a correction. So let's start with the second reality. There will be a correction as there's in any market, bull market or not. And when that correction happens, you're going to see people wagging their fingers and say, I told you so. I've learned to ignore these people because in a sense, if you worry about what's happened already and you constantly worry about corrections, I've discovered it does more damage to your investments and your portfolio than letting it ride. I'm, I'm not a good market timer. I know there's going to be a correction, but I have no idea when it's going to happen. So you know what I need to do? I need to go out and pick good companies. I can't worry about where the market is and when the next correction is coming because I find it undercuts my investing. I've got to focus on what I, what, what I brought to the table. And I'm not a market timer. 
So as I listen to these people, I agree with them. It's an aging bull market. There will be a correction. Are there people there who've lost all sense of risk? Absolutely. There's nothing I can do about them. It's almost a karmic view, which is, hey, what will be, will be. There's nothing I can do about that correction when it comes. And to the degree that I worry about things I don't control, it's going to hurt me as an investor. So, Professor, the concern for Indian investors is that we are trading at multiples which are much higher than the historical averages. Most of the brokerages are of the view that if you're buying Indian stocks or if you have a view on the Indian market per se, uh, you're not exactly looking at buying them cheap. All of them are betting on the fact that there could be a mean reversion, which is that you will come back in line with historical averages and that's the time you should invest. Are you a big proponent of this mean revision theory? No, it's not silly. It's natural. I, I call this the, the, we worship at the altar what I call mean reversion. Mean reversion basically is a fancy way of saying we think will, things will revert back to the way they used to be. And you know what? It's not a bad strategy. It's, it works about 90% of the time until it doesn't. I'll tell you what you need for mean reversion to work. And 90% of investors do what you just described. They, but when you buy low PE stocks, implicitly, what do you say? They'll revert back to the average. When you buy a stock that's trading at a lower price to book than historically, you're assuming it'll revert back to the average. The only problem is mean reversion works if you're in a structural model that's stable. In fact, most of the investing rules we have out there were developed in the US in the second half of the 20th century. And the reason I emphasize that is the second half of the 20th century, the US market was the most stable mean reverting market of all time. The danger though is when structural models change, then mean reversion stops working. So when you look at, for instance, the Schiller PE, the Schiller PE looked like it worked really well for that century, that was the 20th century. There are still people out there who feel stocks are overpriced and they use the Schiller PE to back it up. My reaction to them is the model might have changed and using the Schiller PE or any other historical number as your basis for investing is extremely dangerous. So one thing I'd ask people to look at is whether they think the world today is different than it was 20, 40 or 50 years ago. And the answer is absolutely. And if the world is different, there is a danger here to assuming that history will repeat itself. Uh, so let me just uh, you know, throw in one more ingredient in the melting pot, so to speak. Uh, for someone who looks at valuing the company along with the underlying story, how does one really understand commodities and how does one really understand cyclical businesses? Because when you're buying cyclical businesses or commodities, you're essentially betting on something based on macros and perhaps possibility of a mean reversion, higher from low or low from high. I think that if you buy cyclical commodity companies to play the cycle, you're asking for trouble because the history of people predicting commodity price cycles is not a good one. When was the last time you had an oil price expert actually get a forecast right? I don't even know why we listen to these guys anymore. So I think when people play commodity and cyclical uh, companies trying to play the cycle, they are going to lose money over time. So if you're gonna buy a cyclical company, buy it for the right reasons, which is it's a really good company and people have sold off on it too much during a recession. If you're buying an oil company, buy it for the same reasons, not because you think oil prices will come back, but because it looks cheap at today's oil price. So I think there are good reasons for buying commodity and cyclical companies and bad ones, and buying them because you think the cycle will turn, to me, is a bad reason. Okay, let's talk about something which in a sense has been a serious concern now. The rule and regulations and the opinion of rating agencies. Now we tend to criticize them only after the dam is uh, broken. But do you think somewhere rating agencies need to be monitored or that's a system which is a, uh, which is a broken down system and fund managers, if you're following rating agencies, uh, you're buying them at your own risk? I, I think ratings agencies, there are two words I would describe to, for ratings agencies. One is they're always late to the punch. It's not their fault. They're built to be late, right? So when you see ratings change, it's almost always after the fact. The second is that ratings agencies are, are filled with human beings, just like the rest of us. They caught up, with, remember the words I use, mood and momentum. They get caught up in the mood of the moment, just like the rest of us. So you can, I mean, there are, there are of course, people are, are talk about the conflict of interest. I, I would argue that even if you took all the conflicts of interest out, 
that ratings agencies are still going to have the same problems that they have today in terms of being late and getting caught up in the mood of the moment. So here's my advice to investors. There is information in what ratings agencies tell you. So when I value a company, I do look up the bond rating, but trust but verify. So basically, even if you have a bond rating for a company, you need to do your due diligence. You can't buy Tesla bonds just because S&P says those bonds are safe. You need to look at the numbers for Tesla and ask, hey, would I lend to this company? So for for decades now, we've let ratings agency be a crutch when we buy bonds. And I think we have to we have to accept the fact that it's good to have a rating, but you need to do your due diligence still. And it's not difficult to do. We just have chosen not to do it. OK, in on, you know, various forums and uh, including on your blog, you've mentioned that why you've not liked the Tata group of companies. Then came the Chandra. Uh, regime. He came out, he indicated, he promised that he will do whatever it takes to fix the legacy issues of the Tata group and he tried to do that. So how do you make of the of the initial tenure of uh, Chandra as a chairman of Tata Sons? Do you think he's cut out to achieve what he has promised or there is going to be a lot of uh, you know resistance which he will have to encounter because the Tata group of companies are like an old group of companies and they've got their own compulsions and of course then they've got their own challenges of bureaucracy. I think that the lo the longer a gr uh, company has been in existence and the more the culture is set, the more difficult it becomes to create change at that group. And the Tata group has a very long and illustrious history. Let's not overlook that. It, it I mean, it helped build India as we know it today. So I think from that perspective, change was always going to be difficult. It was going to be three steps forward, two steps back. You saw the three steps forward which uh, when, you, when Chandra first came in. And now you're probably seeing the two steps back where the bureaucracy fights back. But if you can keep the incremental change going and you keep it moving in the right direction, it's still progress. So I think the key for the Tata Group is to continue to work on change. And that's got to come from within. And I think that uh, you know, there will be incumbents who fight back and um, it'll, it'll be slow. But I, I'm still optimistic that change can come. How do you view a company like Reliance? It's a company which has got uh, a very interesting uh, journey. Every 10, 15 years, it changes its core business. First, it was uh, petrochemicals, then it was refining, then now it's telecom. Uh, so in your view, what currently is the current curve or the business curve of Reliance? Because it's got a young business, it's got an old business, and it's got a business which could be called as a business which is contracting, that's a petrochemical business. Reliance has, you know, there are a couple of parts of Reliance which I think are more options than businesses. Geo, for instance. I mean, clearly it's a cash drain for the company because so much cash goes in, but it has the potential to make Reliance into a new kind of company because there's hundreds of millions of people. Who knows what else you can do with them? So Reliance is an interesting company. Again, the petrochemicals part provides the cash flows. If you think of it in the same terms that you think of Microsoft, they're using their cash generating businesses to create new businesses that they hope will create growth. The key though is that you gotta be careful about how you do that because if you let your ego and your hope run away with you, you can end up losing a lot of money in new businesses. So what you're hoping for if you're a Reliance investor is that within the group, there's enough discipline in how they allocate capital, that when they allocate capital to these new businesses, it's being done sensibly. Now, the one concern you should have as an investor in Reliance is that corporate governance is very, very weak. You can't as an outsider do much to change the way Reliance operates itself. So if change happens and it's not good change, you're not going to be able to stop it. So it's a, it's a mixed blessing because having that kind of control over the company allows you to do interesting and new things. But having as much control as the Ambani's have over Reliance also means that as an investor, you're fairly helpless if they decide to take the company down the wrong path. Now, we've spoken about the challenges in the Indian banking sector, whether it was poor administration or lack of transparency or the opaqueness of the system. Well, we can blame it on all. But in last couple of months, a lot has changed. One, now you are suddenly answerable for bad loans. The NTLC and the IBC process is a tight process where errant promoters can really lose control of the company because of 
corporate governance issues. So where is the entire banking sector in India headed? Are we looking at a serious reform or this is just going to be one of those footnotes which would be applauded when it was implemented but eventually uh, it's the uh, you know it's the lending culture the poor lending culture in India which will take over again. I think uh, uh, there is a lot of lot of stuff in the in the financial service sector that needs to be shaken up because it goes back, I would say, not, not even decades. Since. The way lending was done in India was through personal networks rather than through the traditional way of hey, does the business have the cash flows to pay off the debt? You lend to families, you didn't lend to companies, you lend to individuals that you thought were you know well connected, had the business, had the capacity to pay off the debt. So in a sense, some of that reckoning has to come, which is that old debt that you've been given to fam been giving to family groups or to old companies might need to be re-examined. So I'm not saying that there's no pain, but I think that part of that pain, you know, you've already started to feel in the last year or two, as you know, as you see the push towards the cleaning up of bank balance sheets. And you're going to see some surprises as these balance sheets get open. But I think that the process forward has to be that banks have to be independent from the companies that they lend to because as long as those connections remain you're always going to have this issue of is this a loan based on financials or is this a loan based on personal connections so professor you know i enjoyed looking at the last uh, you know presentation where you talk, talked about the fact that there's nothing called fountain of youth it only exists in fairy tale and all companies will have to go through their process of life cycle. So in your words, which are the Indian companies, if you have to bracket, you would say currently are in their, you know, uh, Steve era, which is exciting and growth. Which are the companies which to your mind are in their second era, which is Bob the Builder era, and which companies to your mind are in their third era, which is the matured phase, and like you said, that they are in Bob the Liquidator era. I think there's been good change and bad change, but that could be said about any change. For instance, I thought demonetization did not was was too you know did not deliver the results given the pain it inflicted. So I think as as whatever the the next regime, the next government is, they have to make change, but they have to also consider the trade off, which is all change is painful. So you got to ask: Is the reward that comes out of this change uh, this change going to compensate me for the pain? So I think, you know, I, uh, I credit the government for some of the changes they made because those changes were overdue. But at the same time, I think they got distracted by other changes that created more pain than gain. And I think that trade-off has to be considered more carefully going forward because, I mean, God knows we all need to change. The world is shifting around us and it's not just India. Every economy needs to change, reflect change, you know, the, uh, how how sh shifts are occurring and how we live our lives. So I think that um, I, you know, whatever the next regime is, I hope that when they look at change, they look at that pain gain trade off a little more carefully. Okay, Ashwad, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking exclusively with ET now.